with a awesome. Cool. Hi, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started in just a couple of minutes here. We want to give everybody time to uh, uh, log in, get seated, and uh, ready to go. We had a lot of registration, so uh, super excited. And um, uh, we'll start going in just a couple of minutes. And yeah, and, and to share with everybody, we had uh, 93 registrations which is uh, really cool. I'm always shooting for a hundred. So as close as we can get to that. I did tell my mother to stop passing them out to her friends. Oh, it's open to the public. We, we... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Please tell mom I said, thank you. <laughs> That's beautiful. Here, I can go ahead and drop these in here now and uh, start with some of the um, uh, house cleaning things. Um, first thing I want to share with everybody, and we're putting these into the chat, um, there were two ISACA-sponsored corporate webinars uh, that are available to ISACA members on the website. Uh, so these are links to those. Um, each one is available at no cost to members and uh, will provide a, uh, will yield a uh, one CPE for each one. Um, so uh, feel free to check those out. Um, as always, uh, we are recording. So if you do have an issue with that, we just ask that you back out and you can feel free to watch the uh, recorded version uh, that will be posted on the website. Uh, uh, if you have any questions, the best way. Oh, and I apologize. Uh, I'll be real excited to introduce Tony and uh, let him share with us uh, the presentation. But we also have uh, uh, the chapter's vice president, Rich, Gan right there, um, waving, and uh, and our secretary Aparna Sixaria. So uh, thank you both for uh, uh, joining as well. Um, if you want to reach us, uh, this is the email address for the chapter, and we'll get back to you um, and um, let us know any questions or how we can help uh, make the chapter be as best as possible for everyone. And um, when we do hand it over to Tony, um, like we try to do in all of these, uh, we want these to be as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions, comments, or points that you'd like to make, uh, please post them in the chat and uh, we'll address them in real time as best as possible. And if there are some that make sense towards the end, uh, we'll just put them there and do some Q&A at the end. Um, and I think, let me see, just make sure the chat is open. I'm sorry, I said to put them in the Q&A and I was wrong. I mean, please post them in the chat. Um, we've got both open, but uh, I'll be looking for them in the chat more, uh, more so. Um, the next thing I can share with you is uh, March's next month's meeting is uh, up and available for registration. Uh, there's a link to it. And um, we'll be having uh, Magana. How do I pronounce that last name correct, Aparna, without appearing? It's Meghna Jagdish. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, she is the uh, director of uh, internal audit at Illumina. Um, and she'll be, so we'll be going over uh, the overall audit process uh, with uh, a lot of tips and uh, experience that uh, she, that she uses and shares with uh, uh, the people that she oversees. Uh, so that is available. And if I go here, I would like to hand the microphone over to Mr. Tony Anscom. Uh, the cybersecurity evangelist at ESET North America. Um, and uh, Tony, if you'd like to take a minute and share with everybody a little bit about yourself, and then we can jump on in. 
No, I'm going to be really quiet now and say nothing for the next 45 minutes. No, of course. Um, and this, is a lunch, this is a lunchtime session, guys. So we might add some humour in, in, in amongst here as well, because uh, because it is lunchtime. Please, so. Uh, please. Yeah. Oh. Um, somebody's saying, could you please enable the live transcription? Uh, is that something you guys can do or I need to do because I'm the host? Uh, I am rapidly looking for where that control might be, but you may have that now. Um, and I'm looking to see where that is. Uh, so before we start, okay. however, I can't see where it is. So maybe one of you guys could look it up and you can interrupt me. And by the way, guys, as we go through this pr uh, presentation, because we want it to be inter uh, interactive, you know, if I miss a question that pops up in the in the chat, please feel free to interrupt me. So today we're going to be talking about Log4j. Um, now, Log4j is interesting. Uh, you know, if you look at cybersecurity experts around the globe, most people will turn around and say, this is the most serious uh, vulnerability that's been seen in their career. Uh, and it certainly is one of the most serious. And interestingly, I think it could be one of the most serious because it happened at just, just as the, you know, in that peak time as people started to wander off in that holiday season as well. So right there before um, the holiday holidays got started in December. So I think probably it, that could have made it particularly more serious as well. So let's tell you a little bit about me uh, and thank you for the lovely introduction. Yes, I'm the Chief Security Evangelist at ESET. Here are my contact details. So if anybody's got questions they don't want to ask today or yeah, feel free to email me, reach out to me on Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever it is, you you know, whatever your preferred method of communication is. Uh, but here are the contact details. I've been in the industry around, um, well, I always like to say 25 years, but it's nearing, I think, 30 years. Uh, and actually, I started life, uh, for those of you that are old enough to remember, Koblen Fortran programming uh, on IBM mainframes. Uh, with some assembler in there as well. Quickly shifted across into Fox based, D base, got into networking and security uh, fairly quickly early on in there. And that was kind of my whole path into the security arena. Um, I, before I moved to the US, I worked for a number of what I define as very serious security companies, but also, uh, yeah, I work for a very serious security company now. But what I mean by that is, we were doing uh, government grade encryption uh, for a lot of the UK defense uh, and military. So kind of at the other end of security. Uh, and now, as you can see, I work for ESET. I have two jobs at ESET. One is to come and talk to people uh, about current threat landscapes, things going on. But I also look after some of our technology relationships because I'm based up in the Bay Area. Uh, so some of the big technology companies where you would expect a security company to have partnerships with. Yeah, I look after our technology interaction with those companies. Uh, so not selling anything or like that, but making sure our technology fits or, or how they might be uh, looking to use security technology going forwards. So, well, log for j So firstly, we should cover off what it is. And I realize there's probably a real mix of people actually on this webinar. So let's talk about, uh, if if I go too basic, I apologize, but I, I'm trying to match the expectation of everybody that might have joined. So firstly, it's an open source piece of software. Now, what does that actually mean? It means it's software that has a license that allows it to be used by anybody else. So you can take this piece of software and you can build it into other pieces of software and freely use it. Um, and somebody's just asked the question, will the slides be available? Yes, we can make the slides available. Uh, afterwards, there'll also be a recording, bear in mind. So coming back, so Log4j is a, a, a logging library for Java, uh, in Java, and it's widely used by businesses and web, uh, web portals and such like. The software is used to record and log all manner of activities that go on under the hood so to speak, of a range of computer systems. So for example, logging error messages in applications. So a common, it would be a common routine that somebody might, rather than write this code themselves, pick off 
use this piece of code within their software and use it as a routine. Um, you know, I liken that back to my, my own days of programming. You, know, you used to end up having to program everything. If I could have taken code from somewhere else and fixed standard, standard things like error reporting or error logging, I probably would have done. And sorry, you look like you were going to say something there to me. Uh, have you worked out how transcription works? I thought I did. And um, I've got it set uh, within the uh, portal, uh, within the Zoom account. Um, and it says at the bottom of the screen. So I have a feeling it might be one of those things you need to configure pre. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and if that ends up being the case, apologies to everyone, and we can enable it moving forward. Um, yes, yeah, uh, so someone's saying host must do it. Um, and I'm in the, do you see anything in your settings, Tony, or anything like that? Sorry, I, sorry I'm, re I'm reading the, the click enable. Also, I don't actually see um, that particular option. I'm just clicking here to, uh, I could go live on Facebook. There's an interesting one. Um, but I don't see a transcript. Okay. I don't see the option for transcription. Okay. I'll, I'll keep looking on my okay. end and don't let me slow you down. Apologize. But if, you, if you do need to interrupt me, I can pass host back to you. You can enable it and then we can carry on if you do find it. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, bud. All right. So coming back, yeah, coming back just to quickly summarize, yeah, logging error messages and applications. I think that was kind of where where I, I got to. So, what is it used for? Uh, well, and that's that's maybe part of the big issue around the severity of this vulnerability that we'll ex I'll explain in just a moment. But so it records those events, those errors, and routine system operations, and because of that it gets used in a wide variety. So for example, uh, it can communicate diagnostic messages back to a system administrator or, or to the user. So common, a common use that you might see many companies using Log4j is, is for example, a bad web link. So you know, when you go to a website, you've got a mistake in the URL that's in the address bar, and we get, or you've clicked on a link on a website, it takes you to a 404 error message. And that 404 error message drives a, a log, an error event on the web server. And that error event is likely being recorded depending on which web, uh, web server software you're using, but it's likely being recorded using that log4j utility that is built in to the hosting, so, uh, hosting software. So the web server running the domain and the web link you try tells you that you tells you there's no such web page at the same time it's telling the system administrator there was a log event an error event occurred so there you go there's a, a typical everyday use of log4j so now when you start thinking about uh, why was this so severe or why was this so publicized in december well that's that's the reason because this, this stuff is used just everywhere. So it's also used for similar diagnostic messages used throughout software applications. So like I said, if I was programming an application today and I needed something to do the error handling and logging, you know, I would probably pull off a pre-done utility, for example, like Log4j, and use that from within my code so I don't have to actually write that piece. Now, a good example of this is, for example, uh, Minecraft. Uh, use log4j. It's used by their servers to log activity like memory, uh, user commands that are typed into the console and such like. So there's a major plat yeah, major software product that is using this utility. Uh, but a lot of companies as well take it and build custom applications in-house so uh, and, and put it into their own services, whether those are in the cloud or whether they're on-premise. Uh, Etc. So widely, widely used. It's a simple utility to pick up and use in another piece of software. So I just thought at this point, because if you start Googling Log4j, you'll see Log4Shell. So this is the vulnerability. In fact, it's actually uh, the second vulnerability within Log4j, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So I'm just pointing out 
if you see the reference to these two things, they are related. Yeah, and the importance of just adding that piece of context in there. So when did this, Tony, when did, yeah. Sorry, um, somebody popped in the chat that uh, Vanderbilt.edu link, and that shows a screenshot. Um, I do, and it may be that we needed to do this before we began, but if you, if you can bring that up on the other screen, if you see that live transcript option, uh, next to record, uh, we may have a chance. So let me bring that. Sorry, it went onto my broadcast screen. Uh, yeah, and we'll give this a shot. And... Ah, that's that's uh, how to turn on live transcriptions. Yeah, I don't have that live CC. So okay. I, in uh, in the the menu bar that it, Zoom provides, it's not appearing, which is why I think you have to have turned it on in the meeting settings prior to. Prior. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wish my wife was here. She's the uh, master of Zoom meetings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she works, my wife, for everybody, she works in education. Uh, so she spent the last two years living and breathing Zoom. Got it. <laughs> so. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll uh, to the chapter. We'll enable that moving forward. And um, but we tried, and uh, and I'll reach out to your wife with uh, any other <laughs> questions we have moving forward. Uh, yes, Zoom support. <laughs> yeah, I love uh, it. Love it. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Thanks, Tony. I will. I, sorry, and I will just share with you. We're because we're in the Bay Area when the pandemic started. One of the one of the people at her school knew the ceo of the guy that runs zoom so suddenly we there was a bunch of zoom engineers on their campus so so that's uh, their, their their link with zoom was was quite incredible <laughs> gotcha yeah how funny so, uh, so just a funny story there to share yeah. so so when did this all happen well firstly uh the there was a security researcher in china that first reported the vulnerability to apache now I mentioned this is an open source piece of code. It's an open source piece of code uh, written and published by uh, the Apache Foundation. And this was on November 24th. Uh, now, they actually patched and released a new version of Log4j. But unfortunately, that re newly released version left uh, the vulnerability, the Log4 shell vulnerability in there. So there was then further patches. Uh, and it was discovered that for example, the Minecraft servers had this vulnerable version on the 9th of December, but cyber criminals have been exploiting this since December 1st. So this is where we end up with a zero day vulnerability, i.e. it was being exploited before it was fully understood. And cyber criminals have worked out what the vulnerability was, as well as this security researcher in China. And there have been a number of a series of patches over a period of time yeah that have resolved this because of course once you get an, an issue of this magnitude then other researchers start pulling the code apart and finding other things etc so you end up with a series of attitude a uh, series of patches and it's that's an important point that again i'm going to come back to in a moment so what's the seriousness of this vulnerability well uh, so like i said there's been multiple vulnerabilities but uh, basically, uh, a remote attacker could execute code. So this basically, you know, if we put that into very basic terms, that means the bad guy can run any command on the target system that he chooses. Um, so this is a very, very, very serious vulnerability. Now, give its widespread use and the fact that that widespread use is in a lot of public facing servers, so I not behind a, a corporate corporate system or such like. And now that the it's a remote code execution vulnerability, this is why this scored a unique, a fairly unique 10 out of 10 in the in the vulnerability scoring system. So now hopefully those those two pieces together give you why that scored a 10, 10 out of 10. So for example, what could this mean for the attacker? For example, um, the attacker could trigger some code that's already on the box, so on the device itself, uh, invoking a program or DLL by exploiting the vulnerability. They could load their own malicious code 
and execute that malicious code. So they could do that through a URL by going off to another website. And bear in mind, these servers have internet access, uh, are accessible from, from the outside and to the outside. Or they could execute another command. But basically, the attacker has, full, has gained full control once they've exploited this vulnerability, uh, which is what makes it super dangerous. Uh, it means they can take over any interconnect, uh, internet connected service as well that is being run on that device. So when we start thinking, you know, in real terms, and I've got some, uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit later on, but once the attacker is in and they can see other servers and they can start, you know, they can start to broaden their attack out. So how, how they attack it obviously depends on the specifics of the affected system. So for example, if your web servers are on a specific VLAN kept away from everything else, you may already have been segmenting the seriousness of the, the attack. So to explain, explain that in, in maybe in more simple terms, you know, the web server might be on a slightly different network to everything else. Yeah, And it depends how that system looks and where it is uh, on, uh, within your environment. But they can install, you know, what does this remote code execution and malicious code execution really mean in real terms? So what does it mean to the business that you're, you're within? Well, it means they could steal system credentials. Yeah, that's a pretty serious issue. They could install and execute ransomware. And uh, we're going to come back to, to that issue in just a moment and why, you know, why that's becoming so serious and why it's becoming so, such a such an issue for all companies of all sizes. Uh, they could take broad control of the entire compromised network. So you can go for looking, one, once you've got uh, those credentials for one system, typically you can hop from segment to segment in a network and you can start gaining access to other segments in the network. And remember some other systems may be caching admin credentials that allow servers to talk to each other across networks. So once you've compromised one and you're, you're gaining access to those, that's cache of information. The other thing, you could exfiltrate data through this system as well. So this is a very, very broad, uh, broad issue. So if I put that in personal terms, it's like a burglar who's got the keys of the house, but also he's got the combination of the safe. So just think, uh, think about that. You know, the burglar doesn't only just know how to get in, yeah, they know how to get the valuables out of the safe as well at the same time. And he's not really scared or pressed for the homeowner to come home. Well, no, because he could be thousands of miles away. Yeah, well, and just, yeah, and if they're just yeah. monitoring or, or, or exfiltrating data, um, they could remain quiet. Um, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna come back to that entire okay. attack scenario in just in in just a moment. So this is a supply chain attack. Um, now, when this happened in December, uh, ESET's ESET have a PR company, and the the somebody in our PR company turned and says, "Oh, I've been reading about these supply chain attacks. Aren't they the boats off of Los Angeles?" No, that's a supply chain issue. Yeah, not a supply chain attack. Um, I think she thought the fact that there was champagne on the boats that wasn't going to get here for New Year was an attack on, on society. <laughs> yeah. um, let's be clear. Supply chain in computing means, yeah, it's a, a kind of threat that it's a threat within something else. So I, for example, yeah, if you've got a piece of code written by another company, and I'm going to give you some examples of this in just a moment, but yeah, if you've got code from another company, then somebody has infiltrated that code, you're trusting that code and bringing that into your system. It's within the supply chain of that code. So, so it's a supply, it's within that supply chain, sometimes stepping out um, outside of what, where you'd expect the infection to be coming from. And it's an infection in and a legitimate app. And, and I'm going to give you some examples of supply chain attacks in in uh, other supply chain attacks in just a moment. Now, as I mentioned, this one scored 10 out of 10 on the CVSS scale. Um, it put countless servers at risk of complete takeover. Cyber criminals exploited it immediately. Uh, and it was, 
it was only in the last three, if you look at this, this was only for the last three weeks of 2021 uh, for statistics reasons. And I'm going to show you a chart in just a moment. Uh, in fact, let me bring that chart up now. If we look at this, this is ESET's own telemetry on attacks against Log4j. So somebody trying to exploit the vulnerability. And as you can see, there's certainly a peak right at the start. So a number of different groups actually started to, uh, to try and attack this. Uh, and it accounted, now bear in mind, three weeks, we produced statistics on a four-month rolling cycle through a calendar year within our research team. So from September through to the end, uh, start of September through to the end of December. And we've just uh, recently published our ESET threat report for that T3 period. This accounted for 5% of all network intrusions for the whole four months. But actually, as you can see, was only active for 20 days. So that shows how cyber criminals quickly jumped on this issue and started to try and exploit it. So what about other supply chain attacks? You know, where, where does this fit with other supply chain attacks and why, why is this such an issue? Well, SolarWinds was a supply chain attack, i.e. somebody had managed to change the software within the SolarWinds products, and this one was fairly well documented. Uh, advanced persistent threat actors had infiltrated the supply chain of SolarWinds, inserting a back door into their product. Customers downloaded the software, yeah, their, their installation packages or update packages from SolarWinds. And the minute they did that and deployed them, then the attackers were able to access the systems running the SolarWinds products. The, the, this is, was exceptionally complex. And uh, this is exceptionally complex because they also randomized part of their actions and traditional identification methods in this particular instance were difficult. So traditional scanning methods and indicators of compromise were difficult to actually accomplish, which is why this one went undetected for, for a period of time. But I'm just trying to give you a feel of what a supply chain attack actually is and how, how it fits in, uh, in the environment. And another one, which actually a lot of the media reported as a ransomware attack, was a supply chain attack. The, the attack on Kaseya, their virtual system administrator software, where, which is a remote monitoring and management piece of software, unfortunately, there was a vulnerability in that software and it allowed an attacker to compromise the system. So the vulnerability was around an authentication bypass. An attacker compromised VSA and distributed a malicious payload. And we all now know that payload uh, was a piece of ransomware. And of course, when you affect somebody up the supply chain, it comes downstream. And in this, I think this is a, a perfect instance because we quickly saw lots and lots of companies having a ransomware attack on their systems because they were a Kaseya VSA customer. And you know, there are all sorts of uh, all sorts of media stories around lots, you know, retail companies shutting down all their all their shops, etc. Uh, and, and entire systems being taken down. As I recall, the last time I think I saw the numbers, there are about 1,700 businesses affected by this particular supply chain attack. So you can see the severity of what one of these can actually cause. Now, I will, uh, hats off to uh, Kaseya here, they, and, and law enforcement, and I think all the people that got involved in this one, they didn't pay the ransom. Yeah, uh, They did get a decryptor, and they did, actually recover from the system. So it just shows not paying the ransom is, uh, is actually a, a good thing. And they rebuilt their systems. Um, but, not, and, but just to give you another instance here, not a supply chain attack in this way, but for example, you know, last year we also saw Microsoft Exchange servers having those vulnerabilities that we all needed to patch. And I say that because I think that's super important to actually call out and mention this is not just about patching supply chain attacks. It's also about patching general software that you use in your environment on a timely basis, because there may well be vulnerabilities. Standard, what I define as standard vulnerabilities. So not some, something built in by a bad actor. So what do you need to do? Well, you need to patch. 
Yeah, cybersecurity guys sitting on a webinar going, go and patch your systems. Yeah, it's quite a unique term, isn't it? How many times do we say this? Yeah, but however, I always use a great example. Um, and, and I'm looking at you on the screen here. I'm going to ask you a question, so please, please feel free. In your car, do you have an infotainment system? Oh, you need to come off mute now. Yes. Yes, I do. When was the last time you patched your infotainment system? I should go back on mute. <laughs> <laughs> and my point, my point is, <laughs> is that even as cybersecurity professionals, yeah, we don't patch everything. And we don't always right. consider all the things that we need to patch. And that's and maybe that's my point on this particular slide is, you know, just think about that. You get in your car, you, you attach your phone to it. Your, your phone has all your personal contacts, sure. your email and, and this, that, and the other. How do you know the infotainment system doesn't have then some connection to something else? Certainly if your car is a connected car, yeah. Suddenly then we've got this, this wider issue. Now I'm taking the extreme and I will tell you, I gave this, exact I, I asked somebody this exact question in uh about two years ago in a presentation about patching and uh i then bumped into the same person the following afternoon he said guess where i was this morning he said i'd spent four hours in the car dealership they have no idea how to patch the infotainment system in my car <laughs> <laughs> So I'm just saying that please don't go out and try and patch your infotainment system in your car because I don't think even the dealers know how to do it. But in this instance, you need to be patching anything that has the Log4j uh, package within it. Now, part of the issue here is understanding what does have the Log4j software in it. So if you've got a software package from someone, uh, from someone how do you know that the error handling within that software package is using Log4j? Well, the good thing is there's a number of uh, of open source scanners out there that will actually scan the software in use in your network. And I'm going to come back to a slide in, in just a moment from CISA on how they recommend you, re recommend you look at this. But there are a number of scanners out there that will tell you whether Log4j exists in your network or in, within those applications. Yeah, But going forward, I'd have a recommendation here that you look before you purchase or start using a piece of software. So if you're, whether that's a cloud piece of software, whether it's on-premise or whatever it might be, or on even on, on endpoints, that you make sure you look at the EULA of the software and look for the dependencies. Typically within a EULA, you'll see a category within the end user license agreement that states, and within this software, we use this piece of open source or we use open source technology to provide this piece of the service because they have to show that they're, lic that they're licensed to use the open source piece of software too. So they have to call it out. So I'd suggest going forward, when you actually acquire a piece of software into the organization, you go and look at the other dependencies and you start actually creating some sort of process that you look at these on a regular basis and you create a list, a management list of what software is in use and what the dependencies of that software is. Yeah. Um, so where do you need to patch to? Well, you need to get to version 2.17, I think was the, the release that actually fully fixes. Now there may be a version beyond that since, but that's what actually fixed the log for shell issue. And this is the CISA guidance, and I thought this was a, a useful one because if nothing else, it prompted me to mention that actually one there's uh, on GitHub, they, they, CISA have a list of software that has those dependencies. So they have a published list of software where you can go and look. But also, if you go to the CISA website, you can find uh, links to a couple of scanners, open source scanners that you can use as well. And this is actually a, a chart they use for more for software providers yeah, than end customers about identifying whether your code has this, this particular utility in it. Now think about that as well. Even if you've got a system that's homegrown, 
somebody else may have used log4j historically. So you do need to go back and test it, even though your current developer might turn around and say, yeah, I don't think we use that. I'd still go back and make sure the code isn't, isn't in there uh, for any reason. Yeah. Um, and by the way, the, the, the advice given by CSER over that time frame was, was particularly good. Um, and I, I think the, the, some of the responses from government organizations is particularly interesting because uh, if we look at last year, I mentioned earlier on those Microsoft vulnerabilities. If you look at those um, vulnerabilities in those Microsoft Exchange systems, yeah, the FBI actually removed some of the malicious code that was put onto those systems by court order. So I think the government has stepped up and is doing some good stuff in this particular area. So at this point, I just wanna call out that, you know, why do people exploit these systems? Uh, and they exploit them because cybercrime is a business. They're not doing this for fun. They do it because they they make money. And how much money do they make? Yeah, if you look at 2018, uh, a guy called Michael Maguire, or Dr. Michael Maguire, sorry, in 2018, gave a presentation at RSA in San Francisco where he put the value of cy uh, cyber criminal activity at $1.5 trillion. In 2020, the World Economic Forum placed that at six trillion dollars now at that point six trillion dollars to put that in perspective for everyone is the third largest economy in the world if cybercrime was a country or an economy wow. right so it just gives us some perspective of how yeah you know, what six trillion dollars looks like yeah uh, now there's some estimates if it, yeah cybersecurity ventures have put out a number that they say by 2025 this is worth this will be worth 10.5 trillion. I think you know actually you can't go much beyond a year or or maybe because we don't know what will happen or what regulation will happen. So I think this is but it's showing that this is a growing business and to go from 1.5 to 6 between 2018 and 2020 that's a forex increase in potential revenue. So if you think cyber criminals are not interested in doing this. They are, they absolutely are, because it's huge amounts of money. And what do they do? They identify their targets. And the problem is, is when you see an issue like Log4j, this helps them identify the targets quickly. So they will actually start scanning the internet, looking for systems that have the potential vulnerability in them. And then they will start that initial compromise. Because the vulnerability exists, they will exploit the vulnerability. Now, bear in mind, if you're a cyber criminal and suddenly you, know, you can only handle maybe five attacks at once because you get into that process of, of the attack, you might actually have that initial compromise installed and active on somebody's system. And bear in mind, once you're in, you remotely execute that code, you're probably giving yourself another path in. And then maybe even closing the door or forensically remo or removing the evidence of what you did once you were in. Um, but establishing another pathway in. So if you think you have been a victim of somebody exploiting Log4j, make sure that you've actually done, uh, you know, looked at the entirety of your network to make sure somebody didn't exploit it, clean up, but have left themselves another route into the network. Yeah, And once they've established that foothold, they will then start you know, looking around, moving around the network, and guess what comes next is they're going to suck all the data out of your network or all the sensitive data that they think is valuable to you. Then they're going to disable security systems and then they're going to execute the malware. And this is where we see ransomware typically uh, because that's the big one that unfortunately companies are likely to pay for. And just to give you where the escalation of ransomware attacks, you know, if we look at last year, you know, we all know Colonial Pipe, the Colonial Pipeline attack. It was so so broadcast in the media, 4.4 million. Uh, Garmin actually was slightly before the Colonial Pipeline. I have this slightly in the wrong timeline. Yeah. But Garmin reportedly paid 10 million. JBS Foods, 14 million. CNA, 40 million. And this is as we go through the year. Yeah. Kaseya, the demand was 70 million. They didn't pay it. Yeah, but you can see the, where the trend and pattern of these demands right. are going. And in December, when this Log4j issue was around, and, and I'm not saying that's what caused this particular one, but Media Marked, yeah, the demand was $240 million. Now, for those of you that don't know Media Marked, uh, Media Marked is, uh, I'd liken it to Best Buy. 
for, for us here in the US. But Media Markets is a European retailer. So you can see how this escalated and how, unfortunately, this es is escalating in one direction only. Yeah. And it involves data encryption and it involves the exfiltration of data. And of course, we are seeing some movement, uh, you know, some changes in some of this that may well help. And it may well help. And, I, and I'm going to talk about this very, very briefly in relation to Log4j, because I have a feeling some of what's going on now may well help. Um, it may remove some companies or some institutions as the target. So you saw an executive order. One of the good things in this executive order, I think, and my, my reason to put this in here was actually that vendors need to talk to each other and different departments within government need to talk to each other. Well, once you start having a sharing of information, yeah, that's bad for the cyber criminal because suddenly you start getting uh, greater intelligence and threat intelligence and such like, and you get one more protection from it. So, you know, there were lots of other things in the executive order, but that for me, the cooperation between agencies and vendors, I think is particularly important. And we've also got the Ransomware Disclosure Act. It's, it's not actually currently legislation, but it's still, still hanging around there. Now, I don't particularly like this act. And the reason being is, uh, if we go back to my burglar analogy of somebody burgling uh, you know, is in the house and they've got the, the combination of the safe, uh, this is, you, know, you get home tonight, you open the front door, you hear somebody is in the office yeah, or, or, or in your home office and they've got the safe open. So you go and sit back in the car, you wait for them to come out the front door, you wait for them to run down the street with whatever it was <laughs> is under their arm, and then you disclose it. Then you ring law enforcement. Yeah. So that's roughly what the Disclosure Act is at the moment. It's it's statistic, it's statistical collecting after the after you've paid the ransom. Well, to me, I open the front door. Yeah, I'm gonna go straight back to my car, I'm gonna ring law, law enforcement, I'm gonna tell them to hurry up because I want them to apprehend the person while they're in the act, yeah? So I think you've seen Ransomware Disclosure Act and there's a Ransomware Payments Act as well in Australia. So this is not the only country looking at this type of legislation, yeah? I think it will shift. I think at some stage it will shift to actually legislation that turns around and says, you can't pay or, and it will take the motivation out of exploiting some the vulnerability. So if suddenly, you've got a log4j and cyber criminals can see you've got an active server, then by having legislation that actually prohibits payment in some way or limits payment, it may actually well stop. It may mean they go somewhere else. Yeah, they go and pick off the easy pickings somewhere else in some other country that doesn't have that legislation in place. So I think this legislation is on the side of cyber defenders. And you saw uh, the FDIC put in some some uh, incident reporting as well around cybersecurity incidents. So bear in mind, a cybersecurity incident of log4j type would have to be reported. And this doesn't come into effect until April this year, but it would have to be reported because it's a significant cybersecurity uh, incident if somebody has exploited something like log4j. So super important. I think you'll see this type of regulator um, put in greater you know, this type of regulator and other, other industries putting greater reporting as well over the year. So I think we're going to become sort of legislation and regulation heavy. Yeah. Is it legal or ethical to pay? Well, maybe that's another, another presentation in a whole, whole nother, another topic on, on some other day. Should you pay a ransomware demand? I think that's why I put this in here. The answer is no. Yeah, you shouldn't fund cyber crime. Yeah. If you, if you pay one ransom, that money is going to be used to resource cybercrime in another instance. And statistically, they will come back and hit you again, or another gang will come and hit you because there's a potency to pay. Yeah, uh, And it's becoming, if you look at the, what was added to the sanctions list of the uh, OFAC at the, in December last year, there was also an awful lot of crypto wallets added. So where they may not have been able to identify the, uh, the person behind the wallet, but they've added the wallets to the sanctions list. So you need to be really cautious of who you're paying as well, uh, because you don't want to end up on the sanctions list yourself as a company, because that, that's pretty much the end of your business. And this one, I personally think this is the root of all evil. <laughs> yeah. And I say that smiling and laughing. Yeah. Because it's, 
lots of people make money out of big uh, cryptocurrencies and such like. But if there wasn't a pseudo anonymized method of payment, then cybercrime would not be as profitable. We wouldn't have had the third largest world economy type numbers at the start of this presentation in there of what site or, or when I mentioned the numbers. Yeah, I think somehow this the payment mechanism, cryptocurrency or whatever, at some stage needs some form of regulation. And that regulation is really super important because you need to take the money out of cybercrime. Yeah, all the time somebody can make this much money, they're, gonna, they're going to be making this much money, unfortunately. And other countries have banned it, by the way. Um, yeah, there's, to my knowledge, there's about 12 countries so far that have banned cryptocurrency transactions. Uh, some of the Middle Eastern countries, uh, China, um, but also other other in other locations, a number of number of governments have banned cryptocurrency exchanges. So I think there's about 40 countries that have banned exchanges as well, because it's being used to funnel illegal uh, illegal uh, money. So it's being used for money laundering. So I expect to see further reg regulation here. That's going to help us all. That's going to help us all. And that helps us when a vulnerability like Log4J happens, because it means it takes the money out of somebody exploiting it. This is a slide where I, uh, on a chain, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to say, I'm from ESET, by the way. You should come talk to us. We have some great products, endpoint products, EDR, threat intelligence products, et cetera, et cetera. Please come and talk to us. Um, we can help. But that, that was my sales, whole sales pitch for this whole presentation and all <laughs> so we're going to go to questions and i'll just i'll just leave you with this is the i like to end my presentations on this giving to the cyber criminal you breathe more cyber crime yeah so if you allow if you don't patch systems or you pay a ransomware demand you're giving in to the cyber criminal and you're going to get more cyber crime so patching and stopping uh stopping cyber criminals having access to systems and not paying them yeah, will reduce cybercrime. Tony, a question I have for you is, do we have any idea how pervasive the log4j vulnerability is and to what degree it's maybe been remediated? The remediation is is difficult. I, I don't have the numbers of, um, you know, is there a percentage of people that haven't patched? That's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to, to that particular one. But how how was it exploited? Well, for I think that's why that's why I put that ESET threat report research in there. Yeah, in just three weeks, it accounted for 5% of all attacks we saw in four months. Yeah, yeah, and that report is fantastic. I had an opportunity to download and, and uh, work through it um, uh, prior to this. Um, uh, it, as you disclose that you are with ESET, I disclose that in my day job, we're ESET partners. So I'm familiar with uh, those resources that you guys make uh, publicly available to, to, to everyone. And, um, and also what a large percentage of uh, ESORT's ESET staff is into uh, research and uh, development along those lines, um, uh, which uh, gives all that information uh, that much more insight. And, um, yeah, and actually, it's important to uh, give a call out. We have a, a blog site called welivesecurity.com, um, which you'll find huge amounts of information on current threats, um, things as they happen, or, or research that we're doing. Uh, welivesecurity.com doesn't promote product. So I'm just pointing that out. If you want an independent, kind of that independent research source for information, uh, that's certainly worth taking a look at and we ne we never promote product on it or very very rarely yeah and and that said i just dropped the link for it but even in in, in that site there's also uh great information um uh for families and uh um you know it, it isn't always it's not all enterprise business uh type of stuff um Seems no, in, in fact, just this week, I published a blog on there about um, the IRS and use of facial recognition. So, yeah, we, we try and try and keep very current as well. 
Yeah, I remember one article coming up that was just uh, 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 warnings about uh, Valentine's Day uh, type scams as, as that was coming up. I thought you were going to say not to forget that it's Valentine's Day and make sure you stop and get flowers on the way home. But, you know, <laughs> that would have been an excellent closing to that post. <laughs> yes, it would have. <laughs> it had been just as valuable <laughs> as well. Cool. Yes. Um, well, I see somebody's put in the chat that you know, they know that El Salvador introdu introduced virtual currencies, legal tender. You're, you're absolutely correct. And to my knowledge, they're the only country in the world that's uh, done that. And actually, it was against uh, the World uh, the World Bank, I think, turned around and said that they shouldn't do it. Um, so it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of an interesting one to see where the whole cryptocurrency uh, issue goes. And just to give you a, an amusing snippet on that, is I stood uh, last su summer in a room of law enforcement officers and asked them a simple question of how many of you have cryptocurrency as an investment. And about, I, I would say, 40 to 50% of the room put their hand up. And at which point I said, so you're all making money from cyber crime. At which stage they all looked at me and I was, was curious of whether one of them was going to escort me from the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they got it uh, I, I mean unfortunately the demand for cryptocurrency also comes from companies are buying cryptocurrency in preparation of a cyber attack so they look to see when the market's low and they start acquiring uh, cryptocurrency funds one is an investment for the company but two just in case they they do have an incident and of course that creates more demand Therefore, the price then starts to go up, or it should go up. It's not doing very well this year, I know. But yeah, that's that demand, unfortunately, cause, uh, causes it to fluctuate. Yeah, and, and that was a very interesting concept or thought that you shared in if, may, if legislation were to come down uh, in a country that you cannot pay the ransom um, on, on how uh, the criminals will shift to, to another country. I think it then becomes uh, a race to the bottom. And, and what I mean by that is you're the, the first country that acts or significant country in uh, where cyber criminals are making money that turns around and says, enough is enough, it's illegal to pay them then I think you'll see every other country on that list suddenly trying to quickly pass legislation to make it illegal too. And if you've got countries that end up being slow in that, they will become the target of the, the sole target of cyber criminals. So it will be a, a quick race to that, that bottom point. Um, yeah. yeah, and I, th I think it will be an interest. I think it will happen. Uh, when it will happen, I don't know. But you can certainly see that it's likely to happen at some stage. Oh. Now, I think you've frozen, or is that just me? Or have I frozen? Uh, no, you're good. <laughs> yeah, you're good. <laughs> that's good sorry I'm, you're never sure then are you when somebody else is frozen on the screen yeah. so i think i think we're concluding here aren't we rich aprana uh yeah usually the last 10 minutes or so we we do the answer questions and just round table we can give dave a minute to uh to come back on <laughs> Uh, did anyone else in the chapter have any questions? I think we answered most of them. Oh, okay. I'm just scrolling back through to make sure that we did answer them. I think we, uh, I think we did. Like I say, if if there are any other questions that crop up, or somebody's got questions going forwards uh, after this, you know, feel free to reach out to me. It's not that's why I, I put my email address at the start. And he's back. Hello, Dave. Hey, yeah, yeah. I, I wish I had a great story for you, but my internet just dropped out for a moment there. I was uh, I was waiting for a blue screen, and uh, <laughs> didn't get that. And so, no, my my apologies. Uh, uh, please, I I, I I dropped out right as you were talking about being in the race to the bottom. 
uh, if the legislation were to be passed in some countries. But please let me know <laughs> what I missed. Oh, don't worry. Once, once you disconnected, we only spoke about you. Uh, but you'll have to watch the, the video for that. Uh, oh. But there is, a, there is a question come up in the chat. Thoughts on vendors being slow to fix bugs and patches? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that's not always simple to, to fix bugs and patches. It depends on the dependencies. Uh, and let me give you an example of that. Uh, if you, we published some research, I think it was about 18 months ago on Crook. So you can find this on We Live Security. There was actually a Wi-Fi issue in a chipset. Um, and a chipset made by several chip manufacturers. Uh, we put, Now, we worked for, to my knowledge, around a year with the chipset manufacturers and users of their devices. So think about this, you fix the chipset firmware, the firmware then needs to make it into the products that use the chipset. They need to then patch their software um, on top of the chipset software, the firmware that went in as well. So some, sometimes it's not always quick to fix a vulnerability. I think the point here is it's how a vendor responds to a vulnerability. Yeah, it's, it's knowing that they've taken it seriously and knowing that they are acting upon it. If a vendor doesn't do that, then I'm, yeah, uh, I, I would probably seriously consider using other software. But if they're acting seriously and taking the issue seriously, then that's a different game. Yeah. And what, sorry, what are the measures taken to ensure these kind of vulnerabilities do not occur again? Uh, I can answer that one, definitely. Unfortunately, this is software. And uh, all software has vulnerabilities, pretty much. And it's about the time when somebody's going to find them, unfortunately. Um, you know, one of the thing, one of the big things I, uh, I mentioned in here today that should be a takeaway is actually start cataloging all the software you use and all of its dependencies. So all of its links to third-party open source solutions as well. That will help you going forwards. Uh, but is there a big fix to vulnerabilities? No. The one good thing is lots of security researchers do lots of great work in uh, identifying vulnerabilities and responsibly disclosing them so that they can be fixed before they're ever exploited. Yeah, and like you said, it, it starts with that uh, inventory so you know what you have, so you mm -hmm. know what to protect. Yeah. Um, see if we do have any other questions. The, the other thing, and it's a, it's a little off topic, but it was a thought that you, you brought to the forefront of my mind as you were sharing, is what one thing that we're starting to see is even in some cyber insurance applications, they're starting to say, you know, do, do you have somebody that understands how... Um, uh, Bitcoin or uh, uh, work, uh, so you're able to potentially re respond quickly, and uh, and to yeah, which is so contrary to what we're discussing. So so, interestingly, I have two different. I have uh, cyber insurance listed in several presentations, and I kind of in one presentation I turn and say cyber insurance is a really bad thing because it's helping fund cyber crime. And I say that because I think there's a certain element of businesses that go, it's all right, we're insured. So therefore, they take the focus off of the things that they need to be doing. On the other side of this, cyber insurance is also increasing their requirement for them to actually, for you to be insured. So on one hand, they're forcing companies down into doing you know, multi-factor authentication and encryption and some of those good things. On the other hand, they're readily, they're readily hand over the cash uh, to a company so they can go and pay a ransomware demand. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place on this because it's like, well, one, they're doing a good thing and they're doing a bad thing all at the same time. Uh, so I, I'd expect some, somebody to step in. Well, I think you're seeing it actually at the start of this year. I saw last week there was an article in uh, one of the media outlets that turned around and said, I think it was a school district had a cyber insurance policy and the premium increased 470% this year. Yeah. Right. And I, I think that in itself will, will drive a different meaning to cyber risk insurance. 
Yeah, and we're seeing some insurance com- industry uh, companies just get out of that mm-hmm. uh, uh, vertical period, and uh, and the ones that stay in what used to be a one-page application will now be, you know, eight or nine, you know, getting yeah, in, yeah getting yeah. into those other requirements. And, and, and while, while, while we mentioned it, multi-factor authentication, come on. Yeah, if you don't have it in, installed, please go get it. Please turn it on on everything. Yeah, um, yeah. I think Microsoft made a, a particularly interesting move last year when they turned and said, you can have a Microsoft account without a password. And that's because multi-factor authentication is more secure, without wow. question. So if, you're not, if you haven't implemented it, that's your task for the afternoon. And I was going to ask you if you had any final nuggets of wisdom. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> it, 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 it. There it is. So cool. Hey, um, I, I, I think we've been able to uh, uh, field all the questions and we are coming up on the hour. Um, so, uh, dude, thank you. Thank you for a fantastic, uh, insightful presentation. Very much appreciated. Oh, anytime, anytime. Okay, this is being recorded, so I'll, 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 I'll remind you of that. But no, I, I very much appreciate it and uh, would very much look forward to that. Thank you. Cool. And, and on that note, um, I think you'll be the one to uh, sign us off, dude. I, and I think uh, I...